All right, today we're going to talk about the types of plants. There are four main groups of plants that are still around today. The first group is called the non-vascular plants. These plants don't have any xylem or phloem, and they depend on diffusion to move materials from the ground to the rest of the plant uh, by diffusion, diffusion osmosis. They're very tiny plants. The most recognizable form is the moss. They're uh, really small. They're about a quarter to maybe a half an inch tall. Um, bright green, usually uh, in masses of hundreds of them, and they feel very, very soft like velvet when you see them, like you see here in the um, uh, on the side, on the bank of a stream. Uh, there are a couple of other groups of plants that fall in this group. There are liverworts and hornworts, but we are most familiar with mosses because they're the most common ones. Um, but they're non-vascular plants. They are totally dependent on um, water. They have to have water for reproduction. They do produce spores. The most recognizable form here is the, the green part, which is the gametophyte. And those, they're haploid because they're gametophytes. There's a male gametophyte and a female gametophyte. Um, and they depend on water to move the sperm cells into the female gametophyte to fertilize the egg. And then the stalk with the cap on top of it is the sporophyte that grows out the top of the plant. Um, it, the sporophyte is, is diploid and it produces spores in this, in this capsule up here that can then open up. And, and the spores are produced by meiosis because they're coming from a diploid plant here, but they're, but they're haploid, so they're produced by meiosis. Um, the sporophyte in mosses is completely dependent upon the gametophyte for its nutrition and everything else. Now, vascular plants have xylem and phloem. Okay, so all the rest of the, all the other three main groups of plants have vascular tissue. They have xylem to carry water. They have phloem to carry the food or the sugar produced in the leaves. Generally speaking, the xylem moves water from the roots up the plant, and the phloem moves the, food, the sugar from the leaves down to the rest of the plant. <coughs> the first group of vascular plants is the seed, seedless vascular plants. Um, the most recognizable group in the seedless vascular plants is the ferns. There are also other groups called horsetails and club mosses, but again, ferns are most common. Uh, when you hear, see um, ferns described in literature, they're often described as having lacy leaves. They look kind of like lace um, to some people. I don't think they do that much, but, but some of them do look more lacy than others. Um, the leaf of a fern is called a frond, and they um, reproduce by spores rather than seeds. The recognizable form here of the fern is the sporophyte, which is diploid again. And on the backs of the fronds, when it's time to reproduce, they produce these, these clusters of sporangia called sori, S-O-R-I, that's the plural, on the back of the fronds, and those produce the spores by meiosis. And then the spores are released and grow into the new gametophyte stage. Um, when ferns um, come up when the leaves emerge. They emerge in this curled up found, uh, form rather than just opening by unfolding like uh, most plants do. This particular structure is called a fiddlehead and it's characteristic of ferns. And so they unfurl by uncurling and spreading out. Now, <clears throat> something I want to point out to you, okay, that again, on the, these are the, the two types of plants that are not seed bearing plants. Uh, the bryophytes or mosses, um, the gametophyte is the dominant part of the life cycle, most recognizable form, and the sporophyte grows out of the top of the gametophyte and is dependent upon the gametophyte. In the fern, this is the sporophyte. The gametophyte is a real tiny little structure, about maybe a quarter or to half an inch in diameter. It's got both male and female um, um, gametophytes on the same structure. It's very small. It lives on the ground, has little rootlets that grow into the ground. And when fertilization occurs, again, they depend on water for the sperm to move to the egg to fertilize it. Then the sporophyte grows up out of the gametophyte. It's not dependent upon the gametophyte, but it grows out of the surface of the gametophyte. So the recognizable form of the fern is the, is the front, which is the sporophyte. They also have rhizomes, um, kind of underground stems and roots as well. Now, remember the difference between seeds and spores, okay? A spore is, spore is a haploid cell that can grow into a, a larger multicellular individual without having to fuse with another cell. And the multicellular individual that comes from a spore is also haploid. A seed, on the other hand, has a plant embryo, which is diploid, because it's produced by the fusion of a sperm and egg cell to haploid cells. And the seed not only has the embryo, it also has a food supply contained inside a protective coating called the seed, uh, seed cup. 
And um, so there's a big difference between spores and seeds. For one thing, spores are haploid and seeds are diploid. Um, the spore grows into a haploid plant, the seed grows into a diploid plant. Anyway, the other groups of plants are both seed plants. There are two groups of seed plants, the gymnosperms and the angiosperms. Gymnosperms, uh, the gymnosperm part means naked seed. That gymno comes from a Greek word that means naked. And they're called naked seeds because they develop on the scales of cones rather than in a protective ovary. They generally ha are described as having needle-like leaves, although not all of them are needle-like. Many of them are evergreen. And so when you think about pine trees, fir trees, cedar trees, those kinds of things, those are gymnosperms. Angiosperms, on the other hand, are flowering plants. The, they have flowers that produce fruit from the ovary, okay, that covers the seed. And yes, some of them are fruits, like we think about kiwis and, and berries and, and things like that, but others are, um, are not anything that you would recognize as actually being a fruit. Uh, but it's just the fruit, by definition, in terms of botany, is the ripened ovary containing the seeds. Now, once again, gymnosperms mostly ev evergreen. They're need they have needle-shaped leaves. They usually produce cones, although like junipers produce these little berry-like cones here. Um, <clears throat> and they can be lots of different kinds. The most common kind are the conifers. Uh, then we also have the cycads. These, this is called the sago palm, and that's a cycad, which also belongs to the gymnosperms. There's also a group called the ginkgos, which have a fan-shaped leaf rather than a needle-shaped leaf. And then there's another group called the nidophytes, which are totally different. Uh, we don't see nidophytes very often. Ginkgos are, are native only to China, although they've been planted lots of other places. Um, because they're attractive plants. Um, and then the cycads also very ancient plants, but they are definitely gymnosperms as well, and they produce a cone in the middle, a very large cone, probably about 10 to 12 inches in length. The angiosperms have flowers, fruits, and seeds, and so you've got a flower diagram. You should be able to label the flower diagram and recognize that the, the stamen here is the male part of the flower with the anther producing the pollen and the filament holding it up. The um, Pistil or carpal is the female part of the flower. It contains the stigma, which is sticky. The style, which connects the stigma to the ovary. Here's the ovary containing the ovule. The pollen grains, remember, are the male gametophyte. The uh, ovules are the female gametophyte. And so in, in seed plants, the gametophytes are very, very reduced in size. The, the sporophyte is the most recognizable form of the plant. And that's true with ferns, too. The only one that the gametophyte is the main most recognizable form is the the seedless vascular. I mean the um, the uh, non-vascular plants, the bryophytes. So flowers have lots of different parts. The pedicel is the name for the stem of the flower. The enlarged end of it, as it gets it to the flower itself, is called the receptacle. The calyx is the circle of sepals. Usually they're green and they protect the bud. Those are the leaves that cover the bud. The corolla is called is the term for the circle of petals. The stamens are the male part the, of the flower, the pollen producing anthers on the filament, okay? And that's the male part of the flower. The pollen grains contain the male gametophyte. And the pistil or carpal is, con, is made up of the ovary, stigma, and style. The ovary contains the ovules, which contain the female gametophyte. So in the angiosperm life cycle, we have here the flower with the, so we have pollination occurring. The pollen lands on the stigma, which is sticky to hold the pollen in place. The pollen grains germinate and, and produce a pollen tube that grows down the style into the ovary and to deliver the sperm nuclei to the ovule. And so here we have the, the fertilized ovule inside the ovary here. <coughs> the ovary develops into a fruit the, in the, in the fertilized um, ovule produces the embryo and the, there's a food supply here and so as the as the uh, ovary matures it matures into a fruit which contains a seed and then the seed germinates and produces the new plant now flowers can be perfect flowers if they have both male and female parts a lot of flowers are like this some flowers though are imperfect that means they have either male or female parts and sometimes you have male and female flowers on the same plant sometimes you have uh, adjacent plants that would be either male or female. And then complete flowers have all the flower parts, the sepals, petals, pistils, and stamens. So you can be perfect without being complete, but if you're complete, you can't, you, you are not, you're uh, required to be perfect because that includes the stamens and pistil. In flowers, the fruit develops from the ovary. And again, the fruit may not look like what you think about a nice juicy apple or a pear or a peach. It can be a tomato or a cucumber, but it can also be something really strange like um, like the, the winged 
uh, seeds of maple trees. The wings on the seeds are, are the, uh, that's the, um, the fruit. And then the seeds develop from the fertilized ovule. So the zygote is, um, becomes or grows into the seed with cotyledons in the embryo. The cotyledons are the, the seed leaves of the, of the developing, of the growing seedling. The ovary is the fruit that encloses the seeds. In monocots, uh, the endosperm, which is developed from the, um, from the fertilization of, of, the, of the polar bodies, um, provides food for the embryo. And in the dicot, the, the endosperm food is contained in the two cotyledons and they emerge from the ground. In the monocot, the cotyledon stays below ground. And then germination occurs when the water gets in the seed and then there are enzymes that are activated and they activate the growth and the first part that emerges from the seed is the radical or the root. In pollination, uh, you're transferring pollen from the anther to the stigma. If it's self-pollination, that means it's occurring within the same flower. Cross-pollination means it's occurring between different flowers. Some flowers are designed to self-pollinate most easily, but others, um, the stigma matures at a different time than the pollen grains mature to, to kind of ensure cross-pollination to maintain that genetic diversity that we know is so important. So as a pollen grain lands on the stigma, it begins to germinate and grows a pollen tube <coughs> down the style, and that carries two sperm nuclei um, down into the ovary. In, in flowering plants, in the dicots, we have something called, well, even in monocots too, we have something called double fertilization. One of those sperm nuclei unites with the egg cell to become the zygote, which grows into the plant embryo that'll be part of the seed. The other sperm nucleus unites with two polar bodies, which are extra nuclei that are produced from the production of the egg cell. And that produces something called endosperm. And the endosperm is a triploid substance, and it is used to nourish the growing seedling until it's able to start, start undergoing photosynthesis to produce its own food. And this is essential to how plants work. This produces the food supply for the seed. In monocots, you have one cotyledon, that's that seed leaf, and then you've got your endosperm here inside the, inside the seed. And as it grows, the radical or root grows down, the coleoptile, which is the first, um, first part of the sprout that comes out the top. and um, and the cotyledon stays below ground here, and so this just shows several stages in the development of a, of a monocot. In dicots, the um, endosperm is contained in the cotyledons, which do emerge from the ground, and so as the, as the uh, seedling moves above ground, you lose the seed coat here and the cotyledons come out, and they provide a food supply for the plant until the first true leaves are able to come out and start undergoing photosynthesis. As the food supply is used up, the, the cotyledons begin to wither and dry up and eventually fall off. And this concludes the notes on the plant kingdom.